Well, hello there, and welcome to Pick 6 Movies. School's out, summertime is upon us, and we are ready to hit the road. There's nothing more American than gassing up the car, cramming it full of people you vaguely resent, and heading out into the wild yonders of vacation land. And here at Pick 6 Movies, we are celebrating this poorly conceived family travel idea with a brand new season we call Holiday Road. What's all this talk of summers and seasons, you ask? Is this some sort of meteorological podcast? No, no, no. It's a movie podcast, kind of, where my old pal Chad Cooper and I, Bo Ransdell, select six movies around a theme and present them to you, the listening public. This season is called Holiday Road, and we have selected six movies about road trips. But before we put the pedal down on the discussion of the movie, we like to do a little bit of checking under the hood and give you a look at what makes these movies tick. So before we descend into further car-related metaphors, let's drop this show in a drive and check out our first of six movies this season with a look at Vacation. No, not that one. The one with Ed Helms. Yeah, he, he was the guy from The Office. Also, there's lots of poop jokes and talk of genitals. So, you know, what's not to love, I guess? Eh, anyway, take it away, Chad! Horatio Nelson Jackson was born in Ontario, Canada in 1872. His brother went on to become mayor of Burlington, Vermont, and his other brother would later be the lieutenant governor of Vermont. Horatio Jackson, not wanting a life in politics, went to medical school and became a physician in Burlington, Vermont. The now Dr. Jackson married a woman named Bertha Wells, who had a very wealthy father who worked in 19th century pharmaceuticals. Jackson and his wife had one daughter and they lived in Vermont where he pursued his other passion, automobiles. At the time, people said that automobiles were a passing fad, many of them feeling that they were pure hullabaloo funkaflu and not being able to understand why anyone would want one of these automa whatsits over a faithful horse and buggy to get you where you needed to go. While visiting San Francisco's University Club in 1903, Jackson got into it with probably some other rich asshole, and a wager was made. Jackson took a bet that he could drive a car from San Francisco to New York City in less than 90 days, all for a wager of $50. That's equivalent to about $1,500 in today's currency. Jackson, at the time, was 31 years old. He did not own a car. He had almost no experience in driving a car. And you gotta remember, there were no real maps to follow to get you where you needed to go on a journey like this. Also, there were very few paved roads and there were almost no gas stations along the way for refueling. His wife, Bertha, hearing about his plan said, hey, I'm getting on the train and I'm heading back to New York City. Smart woman. Jackson found a local mechanic named Sewell Corker to join him on this poorly thought out endeavor, Jackson purchased a slightly used two-cylinder 20 horsepower 1903 Winton touring car, which Jackson named the Vermont. It should be noted that the Vermont did not have a roof or a windshield. Jackson and Corker packed their coats, sleeping bags, blankets, canteens, and axe, a telescope, spare car parts, cans for gasoline, a Kodak brand camera, a rifle, a shotgun, and pistols for the trip. This is, after all, America. Their route would follow the Oregon Trail as previous routes through the deserts of Nevada and Utah proved to be impossible by previous travelers. On May 23rd, they began their journey and 15 miles into the trip, the Vermont blew out a tire. So they stopped and they repaired it with the only spare tire they had because it was the only spare tire that they could find in all of San Francisco that fit this particular car. On the very first night, they realized that the Vermont's lanterns were too dim to light the way, so they had to stop in Sacramento the next day to replace them with a spotlight on the front of the Vermont. As they traveled, the rumble of the Vermont's engine and the rattle of the car itself prevented Jackson and Corker from hearing their cooking gear as it fell out the back of their vehicle as they bounced along. At one point, a woman gave them directions that ended up sending them 108 miles out of their way just so her family could see a real working automobile. The two had to use block and tackle pulley systems to lift the car across deep streams of water. Along the way, Jackson lost his reading glasses, but luckily he had a backup pair and then he lost those. <laughs> At one point, they had to pay 
dollars or 120 bucks in today's cash to cross a man's property on an almost impassable road. Another tire blowout required them to wrap rope around the wheel to keep the car moving until they could reach a location where backup tires were sent following a distressed telegram to people who could help them out. At one point, the Vermont broke down and had to be towed into a town by a cowboy on a horse. They made the necessary repairs only to discover a fuel leak caused them to lose all of their gasoline. So Jackson rented a bicycle, rode 25 miles to get fuel for the car, and came back with four gallons of gas on a bike. When they reached Caldwell, Idaho, Jackson got a bulldog named Bud. Now, there are some conflicting stories as to whether he purchased the dog for $15, about 450 bucks in today's money, or if the dog was stolen. Either way, this story just gets better and better. As the now trio traveled through Alkali Flats, Jackson and Corker realized that Bud the Bulldog wasn't doing too well with all of the dust, so they fitted him with a pair of driving goggles, which was adorable. They continued their journey, Jackson, Corker, and Bud the Bulldog, and they kind of got a certain level of fame as celebrities traveling from one town to the next because newspaper reporters would come out and cover their arrival because nothing else was going on in these hasty towns. As they traveled through Idaho, Jackson's coat, which contained most of their cash, fell out of the car. They reached Cheyenne, Wyoming with no money, a busted up car, and a bulldog in driving goggles. Jackson wired his wife, Dear Bertha, stop. Lost all my money. Stop. Send more money. Stop. Bud the Bulldog looks adorable in his goggles. Stop. Your incredibly hard-headed husband, Horatio. Stop. For three days they waited and they didn't have any food until they met a sheep herder who felt sorry for them and offered up a meal of roast lamb and boiled corn. They finally made it to Omaha, Nebraska on July 12th, which had more paved roads and made their travels much more expedient. Things were going pretty smooth until they reached Buffalo, New York, and according to reports, the car hit a hidden obstacle. I have no idea what that means. Now, Corker... Bud the goggle-wearing bulldog and Jackson were all tossed from the car after hitting this hidden obstacle. Nobody was really hurt except for this hidden obstacle. <laughs> Whatever that was. They finally reached New York City on July 26, 63 days after their trip began. And this was the first automobile to ever transit North America. The trip took over 800 gallons of gasoline, you know, not including all the gas that they spilled from the busted fuel leak. And it cost an estimated $8,000 to win a $50 bet. <laughs> Jackson and his wife, Bertha, reunited in New York City and they decided that they were gonna drive the Vermont back to their home in Burlington. And 15 miles away from their home, the Vermont broke down again. So Jackson's two brothers showed up in their cars to help him out. They got the Vermont back up and running, and then both of his brother's cars broke down. So Jackson towed his two brothers' cars to town using the mostly reliable Vermont. As the Vermont reached the garage of the Jackson's home, the story goes that the drivetrain snapped, one of the few parts they didn't have to replace on their journey, thus punctuating the end to one of the earliest, most amazing American road trips in history. And it was an adventure that truly helped to inspire countless motion pictures. This season, we're taking on six road trip movies, and there is maybe no movie framework that's more American than the road trip movies. America was founded by people fleeing oppression, seeking new opportunities, and wondering what's over the horizon. Whether on boats, horseback, or in cars, the American spirit of exploration is exemplified in road trip movies. Whether you're looking for new opportunities or running away from people that are trying to get you. Road trip movies are more of a storytelling framework than a film genre. That's because road trip movies come in all different flavors of storytelling. Comedy, drama, horror, science fiction, westerns. There are road trip movies associated with each of these. Now, there are really two types of road trip narratives. There's the quest and there is the outlaw chase. The quest is where characters weave in and out of situations, making discoveries and learning lessons along the way. Planes, trains and automobiles. Little Miss Sunshine. The other version is the outlaw road trip movie, where your main characters are on the run. This is more like Smokey and the Bandit or Midnight Run. Road trip movies tackle two ideals in American culture, individualism and populism. 
Americans don't want nobody telling them what they can and can't do. And when that happens, they hit the open road to go wherever it is they need to go to do whatever they want to do and be whoever they want to be. Now, one of the earliest road trip movies was Frank Capra's 1934 romantic comedy It Happened One Night, featuring Claudette Colbert as a rich, spoiled socialite who marries a gold digger. Her dad wants the marriage annulled, so she hops on a Greyhound bus where she meets Clark Gable, a reporter who's down on his luck. The two have a road trip adventure going from Florida on a Greyhound bus to New York. That sounds like a nightmare. These two go through all types of madcap adventures, they eventually fall in love, and that movie is heralded as one of the greatest films of all time, being only one of three movies to win Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actor, Best Actress, and Best Adapted Screenplay. Do you know the other two movies to pull off the Oscar Pentaveret? Ah, ah. One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, and... Sigh. Silence of the Lambs, that's right, good for you. The cast of the Road Trip movie can include pretty much anybody. Road Trip movies can feature two men, like an Easy Rider, or two women, Thelma and Louise. The characters can be gay, such as in Tu Wong Fu, Thanks for Everything, Julie Newmar. They can feature one person, like Into the Wild. They can feature groups of people, like Get on the Bus. They can be about people on drugs, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. They can star people on drugs, like Tommy Boy. They can be musicals, like the Muppet movie. They can be musicals starring people on drugs, like the Blues Brothers. You can take just about any genre of film with any cast of characters with any narrative arc and wrap it around the framework of the road trip movie, and it kind of sort of can work. None of which is more famous than 1983's National Lampoon's Vacation. Now, for those of you who are longtime listeners to Pick 6 Movies, Bo did a fantastic introduction to National Lampoon's Vacation in our episode on Christmas Vacation back in Season 2. Go listen to that if you need a refresher. Now, this is my quick history of the National Lampoon Vacation franchise. The first movie is still okay, but knowing what we know now about Chevy Chase being the world's biggest asshole, it's kind of tough to watch him in just about anything. That film was directed by Harold Ramis, who a few years earlier directed Caddyshack, a movie which he also wrote. Ramis also penned the screenplays for Animal House and Meatballs and Stripes, the latter of which he starred in with Bill Murray. In National Lampoon's Vacation, Chevy Chase plays Griswold family patriarch Clark Griswold, a character who in this movie leaves a dead aunt at a cousin's house, probably a crime. He drags a dog to its death, definitely a crime and almost cheats on his wife, Ellen, as played by Beverly D'Angelo. Definitely a crime. Clark Griswold gives his teenage son a beer, misdemeanor at best, and the film touches on an incestuous relationship between what would become the Vacation franchise's go-to comic relief in the character of Cousin Eddie, as played by Oscar-nominated actor and all-around batshit crazy person Randy Quaid. The sequel to that movie was National Lampoon's European Vacation, which was directed by Amy Heckerling, who previously directed the film Fast Times at Ridgemont High. And she went on to bring unto the world the talking baby movie, Look Who's Talking, the sequel to that film, Look Who's Talking 2, and she collected a paycheck by serving as the producer on the sequel to that movie, Look Who's Talking Now. Heckerling then redeemed herself with the movie be clueless, then step back in a pile of cinematic shit serving as the producer on A Night at the Roxbury, a movie covered on this very podcast in Season 2, Episode 6. National Lampoon's European Vacation also included Monty Python alumni Eric Idle in a small role where he plays a character who is repeatedly, albeit accidentally, physically abused by the Griswold family. Clark Griswold knocks over Stonehenge with his car, the teenage son Rusty hooks up with a Parisian and prostitute. Clark and his wife make a sex tape that gets stolen, and the images from their sex tape end up being used to advertise porn. The family gets involved with some thieves or something, and at the end of the film, the Griswolds return to the United States, where their plane crashes into the Statue of Liberty. 
thank God the Twin Towers were less cinematic options. Moving on, the third installment is National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, which everybody loves watching with their family during the holidays until the scene where Clark fumbles his words while staring at the breast of a sexy lingerie saleswoman, and then later fantasizes about this woman taking off her clothes only to be interrupted by Cousin Eddie's daughter in the kitchen as Clark stands in his pajamas with a boner because he was fantasizing about having sex with the lingerie sales lady. The bits in this movie meander here and there until the movie finally ends with an FBI raid on their house. Merry Christmas, everyone. As previously stated in our review of this movie from years ago, I believe that National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation is overrated. Chevy Chase is an asshole in that movie, as he is in most movies, because by all accounts that I've read, he is an asshole. There's a sequel to Christmas Vacation called National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation to Cousin Eddie's Island Adventure, which we reviewed in a bonus episode in season four of this very podcast. That movie was made for TV and it is terrible. Part four in the series is National Lampoon's Vegas Vacation. What can I say? The family goes to Las Vegas. They act like assholes. Cousin Eddie shows up because of his popularity from Christmas Vacation. Clark and his teenage son, Rusty, discover they have gambling addictions. Audrey, the daughter, hangs out with her cousin from the first movie. I'm guessing she's the one who was sexually abused by her father. Ellen almost has sex with Wayne Newton. Clark loses all of the family's money because he's a shithead. And the movie ends on a happy note when an elderly man wins a game of Kino and then dies from his excitement of winning. And the Griswold family takes his winning ticket because they're all pieces of shit. This brings us to technically the fifth film in the series, but it's really the sixth. A movie that didn't have the decency to give it a new name, instead just calling it Vacation and removing the National Lampoons at the start. Hey, it's kind of like they did with that third Ghostbusters reboot, which, by the way, for everybody who hated on the all-female Ghostbusters movie, you're a bunch of idiots. Ghostbusters 2 is a piece of garbage. And that Ghostbusters Afterlife movie was just a nostalgic crank session. Was Paul Feig's Ghostbusters great? No. Should it have been made? Probably not. But none of the Ghostbusters sequels should have ever been made. That Fimo Ghostbusters movie has more laughs than any of the other Ghostbusters sequels. What are we talking about here? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, that vacation sequel that didn't need to be made. All right, back in 2015, it was announced that a reboot or sequel to the vacation films was going to be made by New Line Cinema, which was now a subsidiary of Warner Brothers, the company that had previously released all other vacation movies. Executive producing this film would be Steve Mnuchin, the guy who would go on to be Secretary of the Treasury under Donald Trump. Remember this asshole? Mnuchin worked at Goldman Sachs for 17 years and he made a ton of dough. And then he launched Dune Entertainment, producing films, where he went on to serve as executive producer for numerous movies, including but not limited to Annabelle, American Sniper, Jupiter Ascending, Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice, Suicide Squad, and a bunch of those Lego movies. Steve Mnuchin has a face that just begs to be punched. David Dobkin was the producer of the film, having directed the Jackie Chan, Owen Wilson sequel, Shanghai Nights and Wedding Crashers. He also produced R.I.P.D., a movie that we painfully discussed on this podcast at some point. Writing the screenplay and directing movie duties were handed over to John Francis Daly and his partner, Jonathan Goldstein. John Francis Daly started his career playing Sam in the TV series Freaks and Geeks. He was also Dr. Lance Sweets in the series Bones, of which I have seen every single episode exactly zero times. Daly and Goldstein wrote the screenplays for Horrible Bosses and its sequel. They wrote The Incredible Burt Wonderstone before writing Vacation. They would later go on to write the screenplay for Spider-Man Homecoming and Game Night. And most recently, they wrote and directed Dungeons and Dragons Honor Among Thieves. For this Vacation reboot sequel, whatever it was, it was decided that the movie would focus on the now grown-up son of the Griswold family, Rusty, who has his own family, a wife and two sons. Rusty Griswold would be played by Ed Helms. 
Helms started his career on The Daily Show in the early 2000s, which led to him appearing as Andy Bernard on the NBC sitcom The Office. From there, he went on to appear in The Hangover and The Hangover 2, and I'm guessing he was in The Hangover 3, which proved that he had the chops to maybe star in a movie of his own. To play Rusty Griswold's wife, Debbie, filmmakers cast Christina Applegate, who proved over the years to really be a comedic powerhouse, starting out her career in the Fox sitcom Married with Children and really holding her own in both Anchorman movies alongside Will Ferrell at all. She is a very funny actress. Other emerging comedy superstars were slated to appear in roles of varying sizes, including Charlie Day and Caitlin Olsen of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia fame. Leslie Mann, aka Mrs. Judd Apatow, would play Audrey Griswold, Rusty's sister, who is now married to Chris, sure, you can call me Thor, Hemsworth. And this couple was nominated for Best Kiss at the MTV Movie Awards. How is that still a thing? I, all right. Vacation was filmed in Georgia for the most part. I think everything is filmed in Georgia these days. What's there to say about this movie? I mean, it's Vacation 5 or 6, depending upon how you're scoring at home. It was released in 2015 to align with the 32nd anniversary of the release of the first Vacation movie. You can't miss a milestone anniversary like 32nd anniversary. I think the tradition gift for 32nd anniversary is hamster bedding or black licorice. I don't know. The movie came out and it was second behind Mission Impossible Rogue Nation, rightfully so. It currently has a 27% freshness rating on Rotten Tomatoes, ahead of Vegas Vacation at 15%, but behind European Vacation at 34%. But it's way behind Christmas Vacation at 70% freshness? <laughs> Those people are high. And the original has a 93% freshness rating, but that's because John Candy's in it, and he automatically bumps up a Rotten Tomatoes score by at least 9 percentage points. The movie comes out and comparisons were made to the Jason Sudeikis, Jennifer Aniston movie, We're the Millers, which many critics felt was a funnier road trip movie. Both films were raunchy R-rated comedies that raced to the bottom to deliver crude, crazy, and at times shocking humor, which is fine as long as it's funny. Vacation cost about 33 million bucks to make. It pulled in around 100 million. Is that good? Who knows? Now, there are rumors that HBO or Max or whatever it's been rebranded to this week that the unoriginal geniuses over there are considering making a series about the Griswolds. Now, I speak for everyone everywhere. Please don't. Just just don't. Um, don't de-age anybody for flashbacks. Don't give us a backstory to Clark Griswold's parents. Um, don't set it in the future or in space or the old west. Just, just stop. Back away and leave this franchise alone, because it's dead. I know it, you know it, and most importantly, Mr. Bo Ransdell knows it. So let's say we get the aforementioned Mr. Bo Ransdell in here to discuss this movie in way too much detail. Say a little prayer, pour one out for our homie the family truckster, toss a handful of dirt in the grave, and say goodbye to a franchise that has overstayed its welcome by at least two sequels. Ladies and gentlemen, Clarks and Ellens, let's hit the road one more time with 2015's Vacation. And welcome to Pick 6 Movies. I'm Chad Cooper, and I am joined by the Wally to my world, Mr. Bo Ransdell. Bo, how are you doing today? You mean this podcast is closed? Who's up for it? Should have told you, sir. See, that's a reference to the original Vacation movie. Yeah, yeah. Which is really funny. Do you find the original Vacation movie to be really funny? I do. I think it's got a mean-spiritedness to it mm -hmm. that I really appreciate. The whole bit with the dog and, you know, tossing the ant or whatever, Imogene Coca on the roof. Yeah. And the scene where Chevy Chase is talking to the cop about the, the dog and the cop saying he probably ran for a little while, his little legs just couldn't keep up. Yeah. And Chevy Chase, like, barely 
barely containing his laughter at this situation. I find it hard to watch anything with Chevy Chase in it. In fact, you once proposed a season called Ford versus Chevy, where we were going to do three Chevy Chase movies and three Harrison Ford movies. We were really close to making this happen. And I really kind of balked a bit at it because I was like, I don't know that I want to watch three Chevy Chase movies in such a short time frame. He's such a notorious asshole. Even going back and watching Fletch, it's like watching any movie these days with James Franco in it or Kevin Spacey. I just sort of filter it through like, this isn't fake assholery. This is the real deal. You're just a a dick (laughs) and they're capturing it on film. Straight from the tap dickheadedness. Yeah. Had you ever seen this before? I had. Had you? I'd seen it once and I remembered nothing about this movie, Bo, except the opening credits. Because as I've made it known on this podcast, I do not like opening credits. But the opening credits of this movie are like a PG-13 rated version of a children's pop-up book where you lift that flap to find a little surprise. And as Lindsay Buckingham's Holiday Road plays, um, that's synergy, Bo. We tie it all together. <laughs> Uh, Lindsey Buckingham, by the way, what a career, huh? Fleetwood Mac and a solo artist. And the fact that he was so unfairly treated regularly on What Up With That, it's a travesty. That's what I really know Lindsey Buckingham from most, <laughs> is the fact that he is, you know, a silent figure on a, a sketch on Saturday Night Live. Plus well, holiday road plays. We get this mm-hmm. series of images of people on vacation where you only see half the picture, and then it reveals the hidden portion of the picture to really give you the punchline of the photo there are two women standing by a pool and then the picture pans out to reveal a guy in a speedo with a raging boner this movie does like its boners yes there's a kid on a farm next to a fence we extend out the photo and there are two pigs having sex there's a shot of people on a yellow raft going down some pretty violent rapids and we extend out the picture and you see another woman on the journey falling into the water there's a dad on the beach and we see a kid pinching his nipple We see just a shot of a guy vomiting violently on a roller coaster. We've all been there. All of this, I guess, is foreshadowing of what we're going to get in this movie. The best one is, you didn't mention, it's it might be the last one, in fact, but it's the woman sitting on the horse and the camera pans down Uh so that you see that it's just taking an enormous horse piss. With its big old horse cock. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, there is something that always makes me laugh about a big horse dick. I found these opening credits to be entertaining because they weren't Mm -hmm. really there to be credits. It was just a little slideshow of funny nonsense. And on first pass, I didn't read any of the names because I don't care who made this movie and I pretty much know who's in it. But when I went through it a second time, I paid a little more attention to the names. Whose name shows up, Bo? But Chevy Chase and Beverly D'Angelo, letting you know that they will be making an appearance in this vacation movie why wouldn't the filmmakers keep that a secret because when they show up it, i guess kind of somewhere in act three if this movie has a three-act structure it's a bit of a surprise because when i saw that chevy chase was going to be in this i just sat there dreading his big smug pumpkin head popping into frame probably grabbing a rake or a broom and bobbling it around in an effort to be funny maybe that's another good reason to have hidden the names in the credits you don't want to put people on edge as they're watching in the movie because as soon as you see that you're on Chevy Chase watch yeah and you're like oh no at some point I'm gonna see an old man doing physical comedy and that's gonna make me sad you know whose name I get excited about when I see it pop up in the credits Clint Howard Clint Howard Paul Giamatti when you don't know they're gonna be in it you're like, ooh. Yeah. There's a kind of obscure, not exactly a horror movie, kind of a sci-fi-ish movie called John Dies at the End. And Paul Giamatti is a secret actor in that movie. I think he produced the movie as well. From Jump, the movie opens with Paul Giamatti walking into a restaurant and sitting down. And you're like, well, all right then. We got a little Giamatti. This is going to be all right. You know who else always is a ray of sunshine in a movie? Bruce Campbell. As long as he's not starring in anything, when he just sort of waltzes into a film... It's like, well, hello there. Yeah, I agree with that. You know who I don't like showing up unexpectedly in a movie? Kevin Bacon. Like, I like Kevin Bacon, but like when he was in that Guardians Christmas special and stuff, like he shows up and it's like forced camp. 
Yeah. And I'm like, he played a pedophile. Speaking of which, there's a whole lot of pedophilia in this movie. My goodness. Or at least they talk about it a lot. So, all right, let's get into this movie. We start off with a wide shot of an airplane from an airline called Econo Air, and we hear Rusty Griswold say, "Uh, Attention, passengers, this is your captain, Rusty Griswold. I hope you've enjoyed your 18-minute flight from South Bend, Indiana. We'll be touching down in Chicago very shortly. 18 minutes is meant to be a joke. Right? Yes. And that drive on a good day takes about two hours. Mm -hmm. If you could go to a regional airport, hop on a plane and do that in under an hour, I'd do that. Not have to deal with the traffic outside of Chicago, plus all of the random gunfire that the media keeps telling me is going on there. You've got all of those parades with high school students commandeering them, sinking Donka Shane and... Uh, you've got Harrison Ford's hunting down one-armed killers. There's all kinds of stuff happening in Chicago. So this movie mm-hmm. is just a collection of gags strung together, which is what the original movie is as well. The downside of this is that it also tries to whip a little message in on you, which is something the original movie doesn't give a shit about. The original National Lampoon's Vacation doesn't want you to learn anything, and this movie kind of does. Well, I think you can't avoid that when you're making a movie that has a nostalgia as part of its DNA. I think that nostalgia inherently draws out some type of emotion, as so I've been told. I'm not a very nostalgic person in general, as my wife constantly reminds me. Look at these pictures from long ago. Like, who are those assholes? That's us. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Look at these assholes. <laughs> I, I, my biggest problem with this movie, and we're going to get into this a lot, is that none of the characters are likable. There's no one mm-hmm. to root for. And the movie constantly punches down, but in a weird way, it punches down on itself. Yeah. The first gag of the movie, aside from the, hey, it takes 18 minutes for this flight on <laughs> Econo Air Airlines, <laughs> is there's this old co-pilot that Rusty has and Rusty's like hey I'm gonna hit the lab and in the meantime I just wanted to say I'm really sorry about you being investigated for incompetence or whatever and the old guy is like you know Rusty I really appreciate you going to bat for me and as he gets up the guy says hey Rusty before you go I just want to say I'm really appreciative of you going to bat for me at which point Rusty gives a look like oh this guy might be suffering from dementia Mm -hmm. so he heads out of the cockpit and he sees this little kid with his family the kid's like oh look there's the pilot rusty kind of saunters over like oh i'm gonna impress this kid because i'm the pilot he's talking to the kid and then there's some turbulence which forces rusty to lunge forward and grab the tits of the wife and then it happens again and his face ends up in the kid's lap which is one of the pedophilia jokes so a couple of things here The father is played by Colin Hanks, child doppelganger of American Treasure Tom Hanks. And in this scene, you don't have Rusty Griswold's face land in the crotch of a five-year-old child. You have it land in the crotch of the mom. Or the dad. It's not funny, it's just inappropriate. And there are times where this movie gets it wrong. I don't think this is a funny premise for the joke to begin with. Whether it's the dad, the kid, the mom, like all of it feels very rote and not very funny. By the time you get to the third bit of turbulence, he's just practically ripping the top off the woman. But again, this movie doesn't go all the way. It's not like he rips her top off and you see her tits like it's an 80s boob comedy or something. It's just her like, oh, you know, like covering herself up. I want to pause for a moment. We're talking about this bit of physical comedy and it's helping to at least define the character of Rusty Griswold. Ed Helms plays Rusty Griswold and I think Ed Helms is a bit of a one note comedic actor. He does a fine job playing this role because Rusty Griswold in this movie is just a complete pushover. I mean, he's a a bit of a dimwit and you never once root for him to overcome any obstacles at all in this movie. I think this scene would have played better instead of having him physically assault a woman and then put his face on a child's crotch. It should have been one of those scenes where you do wordplay, which they do a couple of times in this movie, and have the things that are coming out of his mouth be whole inappropriate but rusty doesn't realize it clark griswold did this a lot and you could tie those two together and you skirt pedophilia there's 
some of that later with him just kind of not understanding what a thing means we'll get to you could have done something similar here for sure but instead it's just this really unfunny premise and then when he goes back to the cockpit because it, you know he's like hey what's going on up in the cockpit and he goes in there and the old guy has taken the plane up to sixty thousand feet endangering them all and when rusty says like what are you doing here the guy says you know rusty i just wanted to say i really appreciate you going to bat for me and that's kind of the end of the whole gag also, why would Rusty leave the cockpit to take a piss for an 18-minute flight? Poor planning, one presumes. Yeah, but or he just has the shits. We saw him bounce around like a ping pong ball. Oh, if that was the case, the shit should have come out of his pant leg. Now you're talking about a joke that would make me laugh if the opening of this movie is him shitting himself. <laughs> So we cut to outside the airport as Feel Right, uh, as performed by Mark Rosen, featuring Mystical plays. And this other pilot, who appears to be Rusty's nemesis beau, he exits with a flight attendant on each arm. And this pilot is played by Ron Livingston, who is in Office Space and Band of Brothers, mm -hmm. an actor that we have been conditioned to like. But here, that doesn't seem to be the case. Mark Rosen lets the two flight attendants get on the shuttle bus that's taking everyone to their cars. And then he gets on, but then the driver says, shuttle's full take the next one and mark rosen says see you later econo air and then uh, the shuttle leaves and it says the next one's going to be here in 25 minutes which doesn't seem that long and then we don't hear from or see this character for the rest of the movie until the last three minutes of the film yes there is lip service paid to an actual arc for this character but this is one of the big problems with this movie of wanting its cake and eating it too of like if you want this to be a story about rusty's character in his journey through the movie then be that or be a series of gags. But trying to be both of those things, you become neither. Cut to Rusty driving into the driveway of his incredibly beautiful home. It's this mm -hmm. McMansion in suburbia. He seems to be doing all right. Rusty comes inside where we meet his wife, Debbie, mm -hmm. as played by Christina Applegate, who does a fine job in this movie. At first, I was like, she's the best thing in this movie. And then the character is just so terribly written that my opinion quickly changed. So Debbie is there with their oldest son, James, who looks to be around, what would you say, seven? 17 years old yeah 16 17 for sure yeah and so debbie the mom and james they are discussing how the younger brother kevin is bullying his older brother james and kevin is probably around 13 years old and rusty the dad he comes in and he says well hey what's going on here and james says look what kevin did to my guitar and we see that kevin has scribbled in black permanent marker i have a vagina on this guitar and rusty says not again that's right so they call kevin downstairs kevin sees what's up and he says god you told mom and dad you have such a vagina and see this is funny because it's a younger person saying the word vagina as a parent bo i'm not so pissed that this kid's saying the word vagina as i am that he's ruined an expensive guitar a couple things about this thing we're setting up the premise of the younger brother bullying the older brother mm -hmm. there's also this whole bit where rusty's like even if your older brother had a vagina it, that's fine you know people are born with vaginas all the time and you, if your brother's gender fluid then we support him and because we love him it becomes this thing that feels like woefully out of touch where it's like i understand that you're trying to make some i guess comedy out of this but i don't know that it feels all that funny and it just comes off being a little ignorant to your point about rusty not being a likable character it just makes rusty it doesn't make him feel as if he is like an understanding and supportive parent it makes him sound like he just doesn't understand anything and stupid is not a great character quality and rusty says he's so uh, this is a teachable moment and then debbie the mom she's like Kevin, just go to your room. And Kevin laughs and heads up to his room because he was just like, yeah, that's where I was before you called me down here. I'm like, okay, so I don't really like Rusty. I don't like Kevin. Mom, James, you're questionable right now. And then Rusty says, give me that guitar, son. I'll fix it for you. And he takes the guitar with another permanent marker and he just scribbles over the word vagina and then he writes the word penis. So it now says, I have a penis. But the word vagina is still legible. And Rusty says, everybody get cleaned up. The Petersons are coming over for dinner. So we cut to the Petersons having dinner with them at their big dinner table and james is talking to the oldest daughter of the petersons and he's like sheila did you like school this year and kevin the younger brother bully he's just staring at his ipad and he goes sheila do you like school this year that's seriously what you sound like shut up 
And I'm like, if my kid ever acted like that at the dinner table, it drove me nuts as a parent. It wasn't as funny. Maybe I'm viewing this through the wrong lens. Did you find it funny? No. We'll get to when I find his bullying funny, because I think we both have an instance of finding that amusing. But it's just hateful for the sake of being hateful. Mm -hmm. There's no reason for it. So the Petersons, the dad, Dad Peterson, whatever, is played by Keegan-Michael Key from Key and Peel. Uh, the less talented one, yeah. I really don't care for him as an actor. I feel like in every role he's in, he's trying way too hard. There are certain roles that Robin Williams would do that it's like, could you just like bring it down a couple of notches? <laughs> right. Got you here, need you here. And so the dad of the Petersons, he's like, my son here, you know what we did? We built a go-kart, me and my buddy. Come on, hey, buddy, come on over. You know, it's got an engine and we, we drove it around. Buddy, come over here. And he's like, oh, come on. And then they start doing play boxing and, you know, they're way too into each other. And then Rusty, feeling inferior to this man, tells James, his oldest son, he's like, hey, buddy, come on, we should build a go-kart. And then he starts to play punch his son, who appears to be frightened by his dad's activity, which he should be because he's never behaved this way before. And then this scene just sort of fizzles out and goes nowhere. I guess we're establishing here that Rusty and his son have this kind of estranged relationship, but it doesn't ever pay off really no we cut over to debbie and she's talking to mrs peterson who just starts giving debbie shit for not liking her instagram posts from the peterson family vacation in paris and then here we also introduce that debbie is losing weight and that her wedding ring keeps falling off that's just letting us know hey here's a plot point that is going to come into play later in the movie did you think she was gonna have like cancer or aids or something like if you're inexplicable losing so much weight that rings are falling off your fingers especially knowing that christina applegate uh has had like health problems right. and, and so forth it's like god i hope she's okay she's such a national treasure it's like watching you see no evil hear no evil and you're like richard Pryor had ms badly like you can see it on the screen it would be like if you cast michael j fox in a movie now and that was just all about him having trouble like getting to the fridge like shakes the clown too like, like, right. like Bad form. This is in poor taste. Bad form, Bobcat. And the other thing that you get here is the knowledge that the Peterson couple has just gone to Paris for a week. Yeah. She asks Debbie, Christina Applegate, hey, are you going anywhere fun this year? And Debbie says, oh, we're going to the same cabin in Sheboygan, Michigan that we've been for 10 years. The kids call it Sheboring. Mm -hmm. You know who was really big in Sheboygan, Michigan, Bo? The Kenosha Kickers. <laughs> polka, polka, polka. Twin Lakes polka. Yamahusi Polka, <laughs> a.k.a. Kiss Me Polka. Yeah. Po polka, polka Twist? Polka, Polka, Polka. Yeah, no. Um, Are these songs? <laughs> <laughs> Planes, trains, and automobiles, it is in the Mount Rushmore of road trip movie, without a doubt. What a much better movie all around. Like, <laughs> that is a movie that does a string of gags, but also gets the heart right. What do you think the temperature <laughs> is out here? I don't know. One? It doesn't just do the emotional beat at the end. It has emotional beats all the way through it. That's what makes a road trip movie a good road trip movie. Assuming as you're kind of following that spiritual journey framework of a road trip movie i think that the muppet movie does that incredibly well for sure yeah like all the calls that steve martin has to his wife and i'll tell you another thing the whole like i want a fucking car four <laughs> fucking wheels like that scene is sort of the vacation scene when clark loses his shit in the original movies there's always that scene in plane strains and automobiles it's a little more front-loaded it happens earlier in the movie but it gives you something about the character yeah as opposed to it just feeling necessary. Necessary in the sense that, hey, this is what audience expect out of this kind of movie. It's one of the reasons that, you know, we've discussed this, that we think that Christmas Vacation is kind of a shit movie. Mm. Because it's just an assemblage of, here is what these movies ought to be, and none of it is particularly funny. I I think that the original vacation does a good job of lampooning, if you will, those emotional moments with Rusty and Clark drinking the beer and the kid just shotgunning it and it's just gone. <laughs> well, yeah. and, and that, well, and it has that great moment where he's like, you know, uh, I love you and your sister. Uh, 
Audrey dead? Audrey, yeah. It's skewering a family film as opposed to trying to be a family film. And that's what this movie is trying to do. And that's why it gets it wrong. Rusty, by the way, is passing behind Debbie as she's trash talking their vacation in the cabin for the past 10 years. Mm. Debbie is saying like, well, we can't do anything fun because Rusty likes the cabin too much. Right. So it's the moment of where Rusty is like, uh, you know, oh boy, I, I really ought to do something for my family. And what if Rusty just went upstairs at this moment? and hung himself in the guest bedroom <laughs> and it turned into a sequel to that Casey Affleck movie A Ghost Story and just Ed Helms is trapped in the house for generations revisiting like his earlier decisions oh man trying to reconcile his own existence as a, a spiritual being I would love that take that audience seeing Rusty see the heat death of the universe as a ghost mm -hmm. I would love to see like Christina Applegate just sit down in the kitchen and eat an entire pie that movie is so fucking good <laughs> <laughs> and it's only like an hour and 20 minutes long. It's an hour and 20 minutes long and it has an emotional resonance that has stuck with me for years. And this movie takes more time to do less. Shame on you, Vacation. So our movie's hero is a disappointment at work. He's a disappointment to his friends and his wife and his children. Like he's just an all around. We cut to Rusty and Debbie in bed and they're watching Hell's Kitchen, the TV show starring Gordon Ramsay, a man whose personal brand is the most schizophrenic thing I've ever come across on TV. Because on some shows, he's just swearing at people who are cooking, and then other shows, he's helping people fix up their restaurants. In some shows, he's like hugging kids, teaching them that they can grow up to be chefs. Some shows, he's like a globetrotting dime store, Anthony Bourdain. Just pick something and be that. Pick a lane, Gordon Ramsay. You can't be the white Steve Harvey. I mean, look, there is only one Steve Harvey, and he is, again, a national treasure. So they're watching Hell's Kitchen, and Rusty is looking at pictures on his iPad of their family photos from the cabin and it's just variations of the same picture. The only difference is the look of disappointment and displeasure on Debbie's face getting progressively less enthusiastic about being on this trip. Then he sees some old photos of the original vacation movie mm -hmm. and he's like, oh boy, that was a good movie. Maybe we should make that movie. And they're photos from each of the previous incarnations with the different actors in it. If you had not watch those movies and you're watching this it's like who the hell are these people the kids are all played by different actors we assume you did the required reading before you showed up to watch this thing and also they leave out all the stuff from the cousin eddie only movie that movie's trash although it does involve a monkey flying a plane or something <laughs> We cut to the next day and Rusty walks in with his wife and two children eating breakfast and he says, hey, everyone, I have exciting news. And Kevin shouts out, James has AIDS. Ugh. That Kevin says the most outrageous things. Bro. Who knows what's going to come out of his mouth next? Oh, God. Rusty says, the four of us are going to take a little trip. And his wife shouts out, Paris? And Rusty, the perpetual screw up in this movie, he just dismisses this. The whole film, she's been talking about how she wants to go to Paris. You know, he's like, nope. We're going to drive to Wally World. This family's in a rut and we need to shake things up. Plus, the boys can learn to get along with each other by being locked in a car together. And Kevin screams out, this is bullshit right here. And I'm like, that kid needs to be chunked through a window. Right. He would be in some kind of inpatient treatment program. His oppositional defiance disorder. That kid is bound for alternative school at the very least. And James is saying like, well, I don't want to do this because I don't want to go to some corporate theme park. I want to see the real America. Like Jack Kerouac or the Merry Pranksters. This is the one of two jokes in this movie that made me laugh out loud. When he says he wants to see America like Jack Kerouac or the Merry Pranksters, Kevin, the younger brother, sitting beside him at the breakfast table he gives his brother this combination smackdown it's a punch to the arm then with the same arm a slap to his face same hand points his finger in his brother's face and says don't say weird shit the delivery is perfect I agree. This is a good joke. Debbie is like, I don't know. This doesn't sound like a great idea. And then the movie, to your point earlier, begins to doubt its own existence here. Gets a little meta. Yeah, where Rusty is basically saying, no, 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 this will be a good vacation. She says, you just want to redo the trip from your childhood? Won't that be a letdown? And Rusty says, oh, we're not redoing anything. This will be completely different. The original vacation had a boy and a girl. This vacation has two boys. And I'm sure there'll be other different 
references. And then James says, I've never heard of the original vacation. And Rusty says, doesn't matter. The new vacation will stand on its own. Come on, honey. We'll fly out and we'll drive back. And you're just like, oh, this will be in the trailer, which it was. So he then has to coax them out to see this car, which is the Tartan Prancer, which he describes as the Honda of Albania. And I have to admit, some of the gags with the car, I think are funny because there's something I like about the absurdity of it. It looks kind of like a Volkswagen thing. It's got external mirrors that face each other. So like the design of this, I find to be a good production design gag where there are cords coming out of everything. It's got two gas tanks for no good reason. And the key fob has like 37 buttons on it. There's one with a muffin and a rabbit and a rocket. Yeah. And Debbie says, is that a swastika? And he's like, yeah, we're not going to touch that one. To ruin the gag that I like about this car, Rusty goes to open the driver's side door and puts his arm in. He's like, go on, honey. I slam the door on my arm. And she's like, no, I'm not going to do that. He's like, no, don't worry about it. There's a sensor in place to keep it from closing when my arm's here, which she does. And it slams the door on his arm. And he's like, oh, I, I guess I didn't have the sensor turned on. Hang on. Let me turn it on. Try it again. She's like, I'm not going to try that again because it didn't work. He's like, no, no, no. I've got it turned on. Try it again. And so she does it again and it just slams his arm in the door a second time. Rusty Griswold is nothing like Clark Griswold in this movie because Clark Griswold was this well-meaning, headstrong idiot who just slowly descends into madness until, as you mentioned earlier, he just explodes, almost killing his whole family in the process. He's a lot like Jack Torrance in The Shining when you think about it. <laughs> and yeah. in this movie, Rusty is such a pushover and the only growth of his character is that he finds out that his wife wants a divorce. He never bonds with either of his children. I don't even think he talks to Kevin other than telling him to stop saying, you know, swears. Nobody in this movie ever gives Kevin any attention other than the brother, which speaking of, there is another kind of gag about James, the older brother, where as they're packing up the tartan prancer, he has this stack of notebooks and he says, oh, look, I'm taking my dream journals and my wish diary and all kinds of crazy shit like that, which is never called back to. No. And it's not that funny a joke to begin with. So I don't know. Yeah, I'll bet all this is going to take on a totally different light if James, it turns out, is gay. All this bullying and mocking him for being sensitive and writing his feelings down. Whoops. Then it, the whole movie just becomes a hate crime. Right. Remember in the TV show, The Cosby Show, starring that rapist? Later, it turned out that Theo Huxtable was dyslexic. And so all of those jokes about Theo being stupid and bad at school, it's like, oh, those weren't funny. He just couldn't read because he was dyslexic <laughs> right. he needed educational support not the cruel mocking of his rapist father yeah do you watch that kumal bell documentary we got to talk about bill cosby i did not you should it's good that dude was a monster is a monster i i have no doubt like that's why i don't need to see it it's like that finding neverland documentary where it's like oh all the tea is spilled in this documentary i'm like the tea is spilled i get it the only <laughs> documentaries i want to see are about big feet and ufos hosted by mojo nixon <laughs> <laughs> oh man are you kidding how has that show not happened how is mojo nixon not hosted in search of also i want to point out when rusty comes in and says hey guys we're going on a family vacation they're like what and he says here's the and prancer they're like what and he says and guess what we're leaving right now that's never gonna happen right you're not just gonna show up and be like hey everybody let's pile in a car and drive 2500 miles right now unless johnny law is is on the trail we got to get out of town now remember those guys i owe all that money to they are coming to kill us great grab your go bags and we are going to go they just hop in the car and then they set their GPS and it's real wonky because they're going from Chicago to let's call it like Los Angeles or Southern California. They go by way of Memphis, which adds 500 more miles onto their trip. And this movie fails so miserably by setting up why they would be taking this road trip. They're just taking it to take it. This movie should have addressed the issue that the family isn't spending time together. So Rusty says, when I was a kid, we took this road trip and it really helped us to bond. We could all be together and then say things like, oh, 
and honey, you know how our oldest son James wants to go to college? We could go by your old alma mater and you could show him the school and we could stop by and visit my sister in Texas and we could see the Grand Canyon. You give reason to go to these locations. The movie doesn't do any of that. They just hop in the car in Chicago and in the same day drive all the way to Memphis, Tennessee in a day. It's so frustrating that if you just did basic simple things to stitch this story together rather than worry about what vomit, semen, pedophile, jerk off, murder gag can we put in the movie? Find ways to connect all of these dots and your movie feels more coherent. If you give it also that sort of advanced planning as an audience member when they get to Texas for example you can say like oh good this movie's almost over. These are the four set pieces we're going to have in our film. And so when one of the kids asks what the big deal is about going to Wally World in the first place Rusty tells them there's this new scary roller coaster called the Velociraptor which is the biggest roller coaster in the world and we're going to go to that. So his motive for this trip is so they can go ride a roller coaster. That's right. I mean does anyone in this movie even like roller coasters? Because in the original vacation, the purpose of them going to Wally World, which was a proxy for Disneyland, was that it was like this great American destination. Hell, in that movie, there's a stand-in for Walt Disney named Roy Wally. He looks like Walt Disney. And then when they get there, the punchline, of course, is that the park is closed. The whole family in that film is excited about going to Wally World. Here, no one is excited about going to ride this roller coaster. Nobody cares, Bo. Until they walk through the gates of this place, nobody gives a shit. And even then, they're like, oh, yeah, this is is something. I'm out of the car. I'm stretching my legs. So they're on the road, and this menacing 18-wheeler with a teddy bear strapped to the front of it, so we'll recognize it later, comes up behind them, and Rusty says, hey, let's uh, let's talk to the truckers, and he hits a button, and a CB radio pops out of the dashboard, and Rusty gets on and speaks some trucker lingo to ask if there are cops ahead, and they say they're clean and green, and Rusty is totally confused by their response because it's impossible to like this character. Kevin, the youngest, says, hey, Dad, let me try, and he grabs the microphone, and he says, hey, my friend Jesse says, all truckers are rapists. Are you a rapist? Over. And then Rusty takes the CB radio controller back and he's like, oh, good buddy. Sorry. You know how it is when little boys mouths get going. I'm not, I mean, I'm not suggesting you're a pedophile. That's the second blatant pedophile joke in this movie. And there are more to come. Right. As he's saying this, the 18-wheeler pulls beside the car. But we don't even know that this was the truck they were talking to. Or that this truck was listening to them on this channel. That's not how CB radios work. Right. And then Kevin asks, hey, what is a pedophile? And Rusty starts to explain this. And then Debbie is like, no, do not go down this road with this child that already has emotional and social problems. Yeah. At a diner later, the kids decide that they got to go piss, and Debbie mentions that, like, she has all these dreams of traveling overseas. To Paris? Paris? Right. Have you paid attention over the last 15 years of our marriage? Idiot. Rusty is like, hey, look, Econo Air has been real good to us. I know it's not the international carrier that would let us go all these different places, but this trip is my dream because I get to be with all of you. And then Kevin comes back and says, hey, Dad, there was this weird hole in my stall. And Rusty says, well, what you found yourself there, uh, Kevin, is what's called a glory hole. Mm Mm-hmm. At which point, Debbie shuts it down again, which you think is going to be a running gag through the movie, but then it's only those two things. Right. It also, the dad knows what a glory hole is, but later he doesn't know what a rim job is. It's very selective. I guess his visits to Urban Dictionary only got up to the letter G. He hasn't made his way down to the R's yet. He's got the one a day. <laughs> <The> calendar. <laughs> right. <laughs> He's just up to glory hole and gang bang. <laughs> Wait till he gets to rusty trombone. I don't like this at all. He's just a couple of days away from glory last bottom boat i think he's really gonna enjoy that one yeah as they leave the diner the movie pans over and we see the teddy bear strapped to the grill of the 18 wheeler a storyline that goes nowhere in this movie at all you think it's gonna go somewhere like sea bass and dumb and dumber but don't get your hopes up it kind of shows up for a moment i also think that the movie probably should have done a better job of having her play with her wedding ring here and like it slips off her finger and she's kind of like futzing with it so that when it turns out that she lost it in this diner we have been witness to that maybe anyway so they're on the road day one a jeep with top down pulls up beside them a mom and a dad in the front seat and there is a brunette teenage girl in the back and her hair is just flapping in the wind now Bo, have you ever been in a jeep with the top down on the interstate because it's the closest you will get to jumping out of an airplane while (laughs) remaining on earth yeah absolutely 
It's horrible. This girl's hair will be so fraught with knots when they stop. The only way she's going to be able to deal with it is to shave her scalp. <laughs> uh, which would be a good look for her through the rest of the movie. And it would be a good opportunity for this movie to make some cancer jokes, which it seems like it's on the verge of doing at all times. Maybe some timely Britney Spears mental breakdown jokes. Give her an umbrella and have her just like bash cars in a parking lot. Something that really mocks those who are in need of help and struggling yeah. through life that's where this movie lives yeah. uh, this movie is like a seventh grader like the whole movie is just one big seventh grader uh, yes it has no morality it's just an asshole using profanity talking about things it doesn't fully understand yeah as this jeep is rolling down the road summer breeze by seals and croft plays james looks out and sees the girl and they're kind of like waving at each other until kevin whips out a plastic bag that i guess he just carries in his pocket at all times and violently throws it over his older brother's head attempting to kill him debbie the mom she's in the front seat reading a copy of the help and russ is driving these two are oblivious as one child is trying to kill another child in the back seat by the time james gets free of the plastic bag that kevin has over his head the jeep is gone mm -hmm. And then Kevin produces a second bag to kill his brother again. Which is a thing that comes back at the end of the movie, at least. Rusty ends up pulling off so that Debbie and the kids can visit where she went to college, which, as you said, is Memphis State. Again, this is where Debbie is not a likable character, but I like the fact that Christina Applegate is kind of mean in this movie, strangely, where as they're pulling off, Rusty says something like, hey, maybe one of you will go to Memphis State like your mom. And James says, oh, I've got my sight set on something a little more ivy league and under her breath debbie says little fucker and he says what did you say mom and she says i love you that's what i said i was saying i love you none of these characters are likable up until this point i thought that christina applegate would be the saving grace because i do think she is a very funny comedic actress as i mentioned in the intro she's great in the two anchorman movies i think she really honed her skills as a comedian on married with children and she had another sitcom she she starred in called Jesse. So I think she's very funny. One of the things from the original vacation that I always like was that Beverly D'Angelo's character was always in Clark's corner. Yes. You know, she always had his back almost to a fault at times, but could really, you know, when things got really out of control, she could ground him and bring him back to earth. And I thought in this movie, the Debbie character would be the sane one. And this is the exact moment where the wheels on that bus just flew off in all directions and i was like oh she's just as unlikable as everyone because again this movie is seventh grader and it's like hey you know what's funny angry koreans yeah and so the navigator as they're trying to figure out how to get to memphis state university changes the navigator voice to korean which is a really angry sounding voice mm -hmm. because you know koreans always sound angry or whatever yeah. that'll be a running gag through the movie because we need another group to punch down on yeah. and then they get to the campus and they're walking across campus and they see that there's this wild party happening at debbie's old sorority house it's a hollywood depiction of college life there are keg stands there's people smoking weed out out of bongs you see two women making out no men making out with men not in my america not in my vacation movie i'm talking to you target bud light well and all right so when they show up to this hollywood sorority party <laughs> There is what what's going on is this thing called the tripod chug run, which is this big obstacle course. Yeah, it's like this dumbed down mini version of a wipeout set, like a Japanese game show style obstacle course. Yeah, you got to bounce across stuff and little things try to punch you and knock you off and you got to blah, blah, blah. When they ask, like, what is this for? One of the sorority girls says it's a charity for Asperger's. And it's spelled A-S-S Burgers. Mm -hmm, not A-S-P-B-E-R. Right. Because again, seventh grader, we got to make fun of people with mental illness as well. Yeah, I'm Asperger. That's a funny word. <laughs> <laughs> right. It turns out this is something that Debbie invented. And when she was back in college, she was known as Debbie Do Anything. And they happen to have on hand mm -hmm. a photo album yes. of her being drunk and smoking and all kinds of bad behavior Passed and shit. out on the toilet, giving the middle finger to the camera. And then the sorority girls start peppering Debbie with questions like, did you climb the clock tower naked? Did you show your tits to anyone who asked? And then the last one is, I heard you stuck your finger in the dean's dick. What? In his dick? Right. I don't even... Okay. 
Anyway, so push comes to shove and Debbie claims she holds the record for completing the chug run, which is where you have to drink a pitcher of beer and then run across this obstacle course. And she says she did it in 16 seconds. And then one of the sorority girls calls Debbie old, which is the equivalent of calling Marty McFly a chicken. So Debbie decides she's going to do the chug run because, quote, these fucking bitches are disrespecting me and that ain't right. Yeah. So she climbs up, she chugs the beer and then... Immediately, a little bit of spew comes up, and then James walks over, and he sees his mom on this obstacle course, and then she immediately just kind of face plants. And there's some good physical comedy here to see this mom just sort of spectacularly fail. But again, this movie punches down, and it's punching down on itself. I would have recommended that considering having her complete the chug run, and then when she gets done, vomiting all over the snooty girls. Right. Give Debbie the opportunity to be at least a little bit of a hero you let your kids see the mom in a new light she chugged this beer she did this crazy thing and then she vomited on these bitches giving the opportunity to let these characters as you said see each see each other in a different light where they start to see each other as people and start to connect yeah that is the movie where the emotional beats make some sense the simpsons do it yeah you're right where you find your peers family siblings co-workers you you find respect and admiration in their flaws and quirkiness. And in this case, if she's a violently acrobatic, athletic alcoholic, good for you. I now respect my mom even more, said Chad when he was 12 years old. <laughs> and so later in the car, after all this is done, Debbie is looking rough. James offers her some water and she just slaps it back at him and screams out, what are you doing? Right. It makes her seem like such an asshole. Like it, I understand why you're going for that gag. But you've already shown, like, this character got irresponsibly drunk in front of her children, kind of failed at what she was trying to do. Right. Vomited all over the place. Like, the, this, that scene ends with her laying on the ground and still vomiting. Yeah. And now you just have her being mean to her children. Once again, what is it you want me to think about this character? And the answer seems to be, you want me to kind of hate her. Yeah. Debbie hates her kids more than Bill Murray hated his twins in Rushmore. Boy, he hated those kids. Remember he slapped the shit out of them in the backseat of the car <laughs> so rusty turns the radio on and the song kiss from a rose begins to play by artist seal and rusty wants the whole family to sing with him and bo nobody knows the lyrics to that song including seal that's not a sing-along i like that song a lot and when it comes on i will try to sing to it but as many times as i've heard that song i still screw up the lyrics all the time because it's just not lyrically memorable no. the thing that's memorable is the baby like that part of it i get every time mm -hmm. and you know i've got the voice of an angel it's the soul version of end of the world as we know it by rem like i love this song <laughs> right. and he's like come and see, 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 come and see, see, come and see. end of the world as we know it yeah nailed it yeah <laughs> nobody else in in the car sings everybody's you know sullen because and... they hate each other right debbie feels like shit the kids are hating each other and the parents kevin's planning his next murder attempt on his brother rusty is just in his state of denial where he's saying everything's fine he is setting himself up to be the family annihilator right sure. like as soon as debbie hands over those divorce papers he's gonna lose his shit and kill all of them yes. and then himself yeah. and then burn down the house <laughs> right so this 18 wheeler comes up behind him and it honks and rusty swerves lanes at which hits another car as they're trying to get away from it debbie hits a button that looks like a rabbit mm -hmm. and then the rear bumper falls off yeah. she's like why would that even do that and they hit another button and the driver's seat just slowly spins around with rusty in it that's a pretty good gag i mean it's funny and i think ed helms that may be his funniest comedic performance where he's just freaking out and kind of screaming as the seat does a slow 360 as they barrel down the interstate and in a weird way i thought that the tartan prancer would be a bigger character in the movie like take on its own personality i really thought that the car would become slightly sentient but it never really does i mean it has a few little physical gags here and there but i really thought it would become kind of a member of the family Family, but it doesn't another way i would have fixed this movie i would have had rusty not be a pilot because that doesn't matter i would have had him working for a car company and that he had to drive the car from chicago to los angeles and he uses that as the excuse to go there like he has to deliver the car and wally worlds along the way so it's like you have to deliver the car and as they do 
do it, they're like testing it out as a prototype. Oh, that's a really good idea. And you could have it be uh, sort of that prototype smart car so that right. it actually has a voice and talks to them. Right. And he worked on the project, you know, and when it arrives, it's just, you know, this burnt husk of a car and you think, oh, he's going to get fired. But they're like, no, 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 this is exactly what we needed. We needed it to go through all of these horrible conditions. Rusty, you did a great job. Like you survived this road trip. Nobody should have to be in a car with their family for five days and we prove that, you know, it can be done or something. And you can like hang a promotion on it or yeah. something like that. And Right. A number of ways to make this all better just by making the car more of a, a thing. And the car gags, like I said, I think those are funny. They're just not connected to the rest of the movie. No. Rusty says, hey, family, I've got an idea. I'm going to pull the emergency brake and do a 180 because if Vin Diesel can do it, I can do it. And Debbie says, you're not nearly as good as Vin Diesel. And I'm like, she hates everyone in this car, <laughs> including herself. I mean, maybe it's still the hangover talking. I guess. Rusty does that thing he just said. And when he does it, the car flips on its side and it rolls over like a good eight times. Everybody in this automobile would be dead, Bo. And the car would be inoperable. It's not going to work again. But the 18-wheeler comes barreling down down at them and then it jackknifes and skids to a halt barely missing them then rusty just speeds off and the family gets away only to be startled back to reality by the korean voice shouting at them on their gps and then they finally stop at a motel everything we have just described happened in one day apparently so so they end up getting this pair of rooms at this questionable motor lodge and definitely not a hotel and james says hey dad there's a hot tub down there can i go take a soak and rusty says yeah but if anybody tries to to shove you in their van you give them a good scratch like i showed you and i was like in the real world if a child ever asks a parent if they can go get in the hot tub the answer is always no you remember robert schimmel had that joke about how he wouldn't get in a public hot tub unless he was wearing a condom and had a cork in his butt <laughs> yeah <laughs> and that's kind of the thing especially at a place like this right like this is a shitty looking joint to begin with and now you want to go to the hot tub here and they put kevin and james in the same room together that's gonna end with kevin dismembering his brother and melting his body in the bathtub with acid hey james you want to help me hurt these animals also i think i wet the bed i'm gonna go start some fires later too <laughs> debbie and rusty they're in their motel room and rusty says hey hun how come you never told me about Debbie do anything as part of your past? And she just blows it off like it's no big deal. And he's like, no, no, I'd like to know more about your past. And she's like, all right, what do you want to know? And Rusty says, uh, how many guys did you sleep with before me? And I'm like, how has this question not come up in their 15 plus years of marriage? Like, it's shocking. If not an exact number, at least a ballpark. She thinks for a while, she says, okay, I'll tell you. And she goes around and she starts to like a three-ish numbers on her lips. And she says around four. 30. And Rusty freaks out because he says he had only slept with three people. I thought the Debbie do anything would say 300. For me, 30 felt low. <laughs> For Debbie do anything? Yeah, we'll do anything, do anyone. I guess it's fairly high. I mean, for a national average kind of perspective, well, the, for sure. According to the CDC, when you look at men and women having sex with partners of the opposite sex, age 25 to 49, the average number of sexual partners is 7.2. The point two comes from the pants stuff. I'm really glad we had those numbers on hand. Well, th that's our crack staff, man. They do all this research. I don't do anything. I just show up here and read these notes. Doing good work this season. I really, the yeoman's work. Hey, don't tell them there's a writer strike. I think you have to be paying them for the strike to be a thing. Mm -hmm. And let's face it, they're not guild. They're not even scabs. It's not illegal that we pay them in pick six bucks right no 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 i mean we put on the bills that it's not legal tender except in the storage unit they can go to the storage unit down at you store a lot and then they trade their pick six bucks for whatever is in the storage unit that month right i like to think that we're setting up as <laughs> sort of those old gold mining camps right yeah it's fun the grocery store that we have in the storage unit i mean it's yes it's mostly pop tarts and flavor aid packets <laughs> but you can live off that for a while i mean C in there somewhere i'm sure <laughs> yeah yeah i mean the strawberry pop tarts that's practically a food group that's fruit <laughs> that's what we learned from bird box 
It's what strawberries taste like, kids. This is strawberry, you cretin. Um, here's a s'more <laughs> in Pop Tart form that tastes nothing like a s'more. That's the biggest lie that Pop Tart has ever told. Remember the first time you ate a Pop Tart s'more? You're like, oh, I can see how all this comes together, and it's just like Bleh. the <laughs> s'mores Pop Tart is the most chemical tasting thing outside of actually eating a rubber tire. It doesn't contain any of the three ingredients of a s'more. There's no graham cracker, there's no marshmallow, and there's no chocolate we know right that's why there's a question mark at the end of the word s'mores they ought to just put like a surrealist painting on the front of that (laughs) box so it's like we're not really trying to capture the taste of s'mores but sort of the feeling that eating a s'more creates kellogg's interpretation of a (laughs) s'more right right right. is it like the van (laughs) gogh-esque It is the starry night of s'mores, where it is it is by no means exact, right. but mm-hmm. evocative of s'mores. Yeah, do me a favor. Put a canvas on the ground. I'm going to give you my Jackson Pollock <laughs> interpretation of your product. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So a s'more Pop-Tart will run right through you. That is... that Like, doctors prescribe those before you have surgery. <laughs> Uh, Rusty reveals, like you said, he's only got three lovers in his life. And he says, you're just so cool. And I'm a loser. And she doesn't really argue with him. I mean, you're not not a loser. Debbie says, like, look, just over time, we've gotten a little less free with our bodies. And maybe we just need to mix it up every now and again. And not just light a Yankee candle and do lights off, socks on kind of sex. I will say, I did find it funny that her back is to him when she's saying all this. And she mentions lighting the Yankee candle as part of their routine. And there's a cut to Rusty lighting this blue Yankee candle and he quickly blows it out and puts it away. It was a nice visual throwaway joke. I want to give credit where credit's due. So she's going for a shower and Rusty says, well, you want to do it in the shower, Debbie? And she's like, really? All right, let's check this out. They go to the bathroom and they open the shower curtain and it's just this filthy bathroom with like mushrooms coming out of the drain. Yeah, the tub is like black stained. And then on the wall, there appears to be the remnants of some someone's brains where they committed suicide right it's a crime scene and then rather than call the front desk or local authorities to investigate rusty just reaches into a drawer or something and pulls out some steel wool to start cleaning it himself and debbie's like that's not steel wool it's pubic hair uh like it's a (laughs) scooby-doo episode zoinks one of the gags is like it's not one person's pubic hair it's a bunch of people's pubic hair and we cut away from this gag to james with his feet in this hot tub playing guitar his i have a penis vagina guitar right and the girl from the jeep shows up and surprises him by saying oh you're pretty good and the girl's name is adina if you say so so they decide that they're going to take a soak in this ill-advised hot tub hot tubs are always ill-advised unless you own it and you put the chemicals in it otherwise it's full of ass and crotch rot and sex remnants and they're about to take this soak and then rusty shows up and starts asking his son james like hey there young man uh we're strangers and all but i was wondering if you have a girlfriend now and he's like uh no oh well that's a shame you uh you seem like a a really handsome young man well why don't you take off your shirt there and let me uh get a look at what we're dealing with there and the girl doesn't know this is his father she's just thinking it is a pedophile right and she (laughs) whispers to him should i call the cops and finally she just takes off because she realizes like i don't want to be part of this investigation sure rusty sits down and is like oh sorry about that son looks like uh she got away from you and he says you know my dad we uh, when i was about your age we shared a beer and had a talk just like this you know just like in that earlier movie he's about to give him this birds and the bees talk and james is like look i know dad you know you know everything and james says well i guess there's one thing i have a question about oh what's a rim job mm-hmm. rusty is confused by this again knows what a glory hole is not sure about a rim job right. and his answer is well i guess it's when you kiss someone with your mouth closed because it looks like a rim that's not what it is though is it Bo? <laughs> nah, not from my experience for any listeners who don't know what a rim job is it's where you look another person's asshole that's right it's when two yeah. consenting adults who love each other very much and have done all the usual stuff yeah decide like you know it- let's get into some ass play and they like each other's ass yeah as they're having this rim job talk it concludes with rusty saying well james i hope you're not too old to give your old dad a rim job and this happens as another guy is approaching the hot tub because apparently 
this is a popular spot at this motor lodge. He turns on his heels and leaves. But I'm surprised that this movie didn't lean into that and have the guy go a little, you know, pie-eyed and be like, mm, rim jobs, and then climb into the hot tub with him. You're right. It, or the yeah. you, we'll get to the truck driver stuff later, but that is also an open-ended pedophile question. This movie really does love pedophilia. There's a lot of pedophilia in this movie. A shocking amount of pedophilia. Yeah. All right. So, We're on to day two, and the family's in the car, and everyone's asleep except for Rusty, who is driving. And here we get a repeat of the Christy Brinkley scene from the original vacation, where a sexy woman in a red convertible pulls up beside Rusty, and they kind of make eyes at one another. It really doesn't go anywhere. And then she drifts into oncoming traffic, and she gets crushed by an 18-wheeler head-on. Rusty looks in the rearview mirror, but because the Tartan Prancer has mirrors placed in such bizarre ways, one mirror is looking back back at him so he's kind of looking at himself in the rearview mirror and it blocks the horrific accident that's behind him should be noted that the woman in the ferrari is hannah jeter wife of Derek jeter hmm. yeah Derek jeter obviously uh a famous painter uh I, if you say so i just that's the notes here um that i have to say that oh hold on he is involved in sport oh so. oh Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, he plays for my favorite sport club. And hold on, hold on, they're telling me in the booth, his father, Michael Jeter. Oh, interesting. Star <laughs> of uh, The Fisher King and Evening Shade. I appreciate that. Imagine Michael Jeter being Derek <laughs> Jeter's dad. <laughs> Those Christmases, what that would be like. Everything's oh. coming up, movies. <laughs> Our videos, that's what it was from Fisher King. <laughs> now I'm just thinking of Jeff Bridges with Michael Jeter in his arms from that movie. It's like, did you know when you went crazy, did it happen all at once or did it happen slowly? So anyway, we're on our way to Texas where we are visiting Audrey. The only reason you know we're on our way to Texas to visit Audrey is because, Bo, you've seen this movie. Right. The audience doesn't know that that's where we're going and they don't even know what an Audrey is, let alone who an Audrey is. Yes. And also, they're not... <laughs> not really talking about audrey everything in the conversation is about her husband stone who is yes. a local weatherman who has ambitions and apparently some interest in going national mm -hmm. this is the joke that i like in the movie the most take it which is james saying oh hey when we get to audrey's do you think i can ride stone's horse and rusty says well sure son and kevin says hey can i shoot stone's gun and debbie says absolutely not and then kevin leans to james and whispers too bad. I would have shot you right off that fucking horse. It's a good joke. It's a good joke. Rusty says it's surprising that Audrey went for Stone because he's so politically conservative. Mm -hmm. Debbie says, well, just because he has different beliefs, it doesn't mean that he's not still good looking. I mean, a good person. Yeah. Establishing that Stone is this god of a man. And kind of shitting on her husband at the same of time. Of course. Who she hates. Yeah. And But then they see a sign for Hot Springs in Arkansas and Rusty says, you know, we've always wanted to do this. Let's take a, a little side trip and go to these hot springs because there's probably a comedy gag in there oh boy is there Bo? <laughs> so when they get there there's this huge line of cars lined up to get to these hot springs yes. and they see this local with a rat on his shoulder passing by and rusty calls over to him and he's some hillbilly he just looks like a cletus the slack-jawed yokel type. very much so rusty says hey is there a shortcut around here anywhere my good man and the guy says oh yeah you can take it dirt road up and follow of that little shortcut up to some hot springs then rusty says i appreciate that by the way what's your pet rat's name mm -hmm. and then the guy just loses his shit and freaks out the one throwaway line i think is pretty funny is him saying i don't know him as yeah. if the rat is you know a, a people one thing about a movie like this especially when you come in and i don't know that they make fun of stone's political leanings which are positioned to be more conservative than than liberal but whenever movies like this where people from the city go into the country and they're kind of making fun of people from the country i think that you're in a place where you may be alienating a large portion of your audience because you're making fun of rednecks or just people that live in rural areas i think where this movie works better is where again that's punching down you can have a situation where the city-fied folk come into the country and because of their own either hubris or arrogance 
or whatever it is that they bring from a more metropolitan area is completely inaccurate and they kind of are their own downfall. And here they don't do that. In fact, the way that it's played out is that the country folk are not only stupid and weirdos, they're also thieves and liars. Like everyone in this movie is just awful. Yeah. They go to the hot springs and to make a long story short, they get into the water and it turns out that it's raw sewage and they just smear shit all over themselves. They find random syringes and Kevin throws one at James. Wait, Kevin? James? Kevin James? Oh, Oh, you. And so they <laughs> jump out once they realize this is shit. They run out of the hot spring back to their car because they are they hear the car alarm going off. And when they get there, they find that their car has been broken into. Everything is gone. Not everything because there's a, the copy of The Help that Debbie is reading. And also right. a spray painted dick and balls has been left on the side of this tartan prancer. Yeah. It also feels like, especially when we get to the next gag, when they show up at stone and aubrey's house i felt like that the spray painted cock and balls shouldn't have been on the side of the car but should have been on the back of the car so they didn't see it until they get there and then it's revealed but when you see it here it's like okay although i can name at least three people from our youth that would have broken into a car and then gone back to get spray paint to put a cock and balls <laughs> on a car. right i it is this movie's equivalent of the bhp which we have addressed yeah, previously it, on this show it is they get in their car and they they drive to Aubrey and Stone's house, which is this ranch style mansion. This is where we get the joke I was alluding to just a moment ago, where everybody gets out and then Rusty and Debbie, they see the big spray painted dick and balls on their car. And they're like, oh, we need to get this off because that's so embarrassing. So they spit on their hands and he's like, you work the balls, I'll work the shaft. And then his sister and Stone come out to see them jerking off this spray painted cock. Right. It's as funny as I'm describing it. But surprise in this movie, when they walk out, out, we see that the always talked about stone is played by Chris Hemsworth, who is having a very good time playing this rich, handsome Texas weatherman. Yeah, I wish they gave him a little more to do do and also there's a running gag of him constantly referencing faucets for no reason yeah that i don't think is very funny but the movie even references it it's like what's with all the faucets and you're like yeah that's what we were thinking you know you don't need to say what's going through our head <laughs> i will say that i think chris hemsworth has good comedic timing they certainly tapped into that in those latter marvel movies oh yeah as thor he was one of the funniest parts of paul feig's ghostbusters absolutely every moment that he's on screen in that except for maybe some of the dancing which was silly he is hysterical there are not very many people that are this good looking that are also this funny i think channing tatum is able to pull that off jenny mccarthy is one who i think is genuinely funny i think charlie theron is a beautiful person that is also capable of being very funny in films and television absolutely but for the most part beautiful people haven't had to suffer enough to figure out what it takes to have a personality speaking of that ghostbusters movie there is that bit where i think it's the job interview which is probably the funniest scene in that movie is where they're interviewing him for the job where mm -hmm. he's wearing the glasses and at one point reaches through them because there are no lenses to scratch his eye yeah that's a great bit of subtle comedy and he just pulls it off so well yeah he's super funny and the problem is that this movie doesn't give him anything to do the scene in the bedroom is the closest thing yeah we'll get to in just a moment but we're getting ahead yeah of ourselves. so they show up and they smell like shit so they're like come on in and we've got some clothes we were going to give to the the church and we'll get y'all dressed up so the whole family gets dressed up and they're wearing like country western gear and debbie is wearing a dress that used to belong to aubrey because the joke is that stone aka chris hemsworth is saying Hey, Audrey, you remember the first time you wore that dress? And then they just start to get horny for each other and make out yeah. in front of Rusty and Debbie. Finally, Audrey breaks it off and is like, hey, y'all want to go see Stone's Man Cave? Which they do. And this is a gag that I don't even understand. It's just them going to his den where there's a picture of him and Charlton Heston. Stone talks about how he and Chuck Heston, as he calls him, cried over the state of the country and makes another faucet joke. Mm -hmm. Like, even a faucet drips every now and again. Then it comes 
cuts outside. That's the whole gag. They go outside and they're all eating dinner and it's barbecue. And over this meal, there's a line where Aubrey says that Stone did a weather report. And because of his early warning, he was able to save 2,000 people's lives. And that's how many people died at Pearl Harbor. So basically Stone prevented Pearl Harbor. And I thought that was funny illogic. Yes. One of the kids, James, says, you're a hero. Stone says, well, you know, actually the hero is sitting right beside you. And James looks to the empty chair to his right. And Stone's like, no, no, the other way, your, your father there. Because every time Rusty here doesn't crash a plane, it's like he's saving lives too. Also, he nailed down this hot little piece of ass named Debbie. And he keeps hitting on Debbie. At one point, Stone gets up and feeds beef ribs to a cow. Which, again, at that point, we've had no reason to not like Stone. Other than him kind of hitting on Debbie. But just like, well, maybe he's just this horny, rich weather man Texan but the moment he starts feeding cows to cows you're like this is getting bizarre and this is where I was thinking oh is this going to turn into a rich version of Cousin Eddie that he's going to be batshit crazy but he just has money but that's not what happens Stone then decides to let the boys come out and herd cattle in the morning and Rusty agrees to come help him and then Aubrey says to her brother I don't know why you wanted to go back to Wally World after dad flipped out on that trip and during this time Stone leans over and wipes barbecue sauce off Debbie's face in this seductive way and she just like closes her eyes and puddles the ground beneath her and then Aubrey says something incredibly perplexing she says maybe we can take baby Cooper on a vacation next year not to Wally World but maybe to Paris and she's like and when we get back I can get a part-time job and Stone shuts down the idea of her getting a job but I was like whoa 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 who is baby Cooper right are you pregnant are you planning on having a baby? Is this your dog? I don't know what's going on. Also, this running joke, because it comes up a couple of times where Stone is refusing to allow Audrey to work, even though it's clear that she wants to because it gave her a sense of purpose. Once more, like, am I supposed to just hate this character and think that he's really close minded? And is that what conservatism means to the writers of this movie is that he feeds cows to other cows, sits around crying with Charlton Heston and won't let his wife have have the autonomy to work and if it doesn't matter in your movie don't mention it. right it doesn't flesh out the characters or their relationship or progress the plot get rid of it we go to the bedroom later where debbie and rusty are staying debbie is saying you know i'm really happy for audrey it seems like she's got a good life here and she's kind of drunk and she wants to have sex with rusty and rusty says no 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 you're all horned up just because you've been around stone and i was like look i don't care where you got your appetite as long as you come home to eat yeah and there's a bit of foreshadowing here where rusty complains about the jeans that stone lend him where he says these are all stretched out in the crotch and christina applegate has a funny delivery of why would they oh shit as she kind of puts two and two together she has real moments of comedic spark in this film yeah and then Rusty at this point notices that her wedding ring is missing. Mm -hmm. Debbie is like, I don't know where it is. I did not take it off on purpose. I would never do that. And this is where Stone comes in to check on him. And it's just Chris Hemsworth in boxer briefs yeah. with an enormous fake cock strapped to his like like held in place by these boxer briefs. It looks like he has a police issue flashlight. <laughs> strapped to his leg i mean it's a horse cock in his pants yes and it's uh, like he keeps lifting his leg to put his foot on a chair or something nearby to really show it off and comes close uh, to rusty and debbie's eyes are just locked on this thing my eyes were locked on it the whole time of course i just want to say chris hemsworth the smile that he is fighting back off of his face during this scene is pretty awesome the pause that he has at the door just before he leaves i think that was the actor's choice he stops and turns around he's so proud of his huge dick as he should be sure I mean, look, if I had that thing, I would not be working a regular job. I would have made my bones in pornography. I wouldn't be a weatherman. No. And then Rusty, to show once again that he's an idiot, says, can you believe he came in here just to show off his six pack? <laughs> Then we cut to the next morning where Stone and Rusty are on four wheelers. And herding cows. Herding the cows back into the barn. Rusty says, hey there, are there going to be helmets? And Stone says, well, yeah, I keep them with the tampons. 
Right. Uh, so they split up to wrangle some cows that have gone rogue on this small farm. As Rusty is kind of gunning the four-wheeler around, he looks over and there's his family waving to him from the lawn. And he's waving to them, not watching where he's going. And then looks forward again just in time for him to realize that he is about to collide with a cow. Which he does, and it explodes like it's a water balloon filled with pig intestines. We cut to stone, hosing blood and guts off rusty with a hose as the family looks on and here we see that aubrey's holding a baby i'm guessing that's baby cooper i guess then they just leave that's the end of the joke he gets hosed down and then the family takes off and the follow-up gag is that the big dick on their car has been covered up with tape and paper and that's it yeah as they drive away the family starts making bad cow pun jokes rusty says one then debbie says one then james says one and then kevin just calls his brother a piece of shit yeah no you don't you yeah. don't get it you kind of ruined it yeah and we also see the 18 wheeler with the teddy bear on the front of it to remind us that's still a thing in our movie for some reason yes then we stop at the wampum motel uh-huh. where they all sleep in a teepee and russ wakes up and he's like hey deb you know we're real close to the four corners where four states all touch let's go there and have sex in four states and she's like all right so <laughs> that's what they do they go to the four corners to have sex then james wakes up to find his parents gone so he leaves he goes outside and the cute girl from the jeep earlier she's there in the middle of the night i guess that's what she does at night just go sit out in the courtyard at these motels and then james explains that the pedophile from the night before was his dad and that he's not a pedophile just a, a dimwit and then this scene starts to have a moment but it ends with james asking if he can give this girl a rim job because he thinks that's a gentle kid and then kevin just comes out of this wigwam thing that they're sleeping in and just starts chunking rocks at his brother and then the cute girl says hey you should go kick his ass and then here james stands up to his little brother and kind of beats him up in the strangest way possible because he's bigger than him is this a turning point for james kind of but not really it's really strange because it doesn't totally inform the rest of the movie other than i guess kevin isn't mean to him anymore right. it, it sort of ends with james giving anita this quick kiss and heading inside anita rightfully saying that's a weird fucking family cut to russ and debbie at four corners and they sneak in under the dark at night and as they're approaching the location to have sex it turns out there's a whole bunch of other weirdos there waiting to have sex and then the camera quick edits to these people in various states of dress and it's like flipping through the pages of a national geographic from 1958 leg ankle stomach bare breast that you really don't want to see in the nude jiggling out it's like the kind of people that go to nude beaches it's nothing you want to see <laughs> right then the cops show up, Chad. Beat it's the cops. The only people left are Rusty and Debbie. The gag here is that cops show up from all four states to converge on right. this, and they're claiming jurisdiction on arresting Rusty and Debbie. It escalates. They, they start arguing and yelling at each other, and they're all comedians of some notes. There's like Nick Kroll and Tim Hedeker, right? Caitlin Olson from Always Sunny, and Michael Pena. He's the fourth. And they make racist jokes or jokes about the state that they're in and they just argue to the point to where debbie and rusty just leave right and the cops end up forcing each other onto the ground with their guns pushed in front of them in this mutual standoff that's something else that's strange about this movie a lot of the gags come from other characters but not the main characters of our movie like james and kevin never really get involved in shenanigans and that wasn't the case in the other vacation movies so they're crossing the grand canyon on their way to wally world mm. the next day james friends adina on facebook as soon as he friends this girl on facebook he immediately changes his status to in a relationship which is creepy again giving us more reason to not like this character but it doesn't ever really come to anything like isn't adina kind of out of the movie at this point at the very end when we get the postcards of the characters from our movie there is a shot of james and adina kissing and on a back porch and then you see that rusty is behind him like giving him the don't get her pregnant look or something right, but but in the movie itself no she's not in the movie anymore. which seems crazy to me because you leave it at yes she helped him what she said don't take that shit from your brother right and that's it like the relationship between the two of them feels like it just stops there 
because it does. But we we have another gag to get to. Here's the thing about all the gags in this movie. You could edit any one of them out or all of them out. Well, if you edit them all out, you don't have a movie. <laughs> now you're talking. Them having sex at Four Corners, you could edit that out. Doesn't matter. The scene we're about to talk about with whitewater rafting, that doesn't matter. Like none of this, as opposed to if you look at a better movie like Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, if you edited out any of the moments where they had comedic mishaps, you miss key plot points. You miss character development. There are integral things into the comedic set pieces of that film. Here, not at all. The gag here is that they're going on a whitewater rafting trip down the Colorado River, and the guide is Charlie Day. Speaking of it, it's always sunny. Here's another cast member from that and he's funny in this he's capturing something i think that is generally true if you've ever worked in any kind of corporate training or gone with tour guides and that kind of thing you'll run into this kind of person who is full of little quips like i'm really looking forward to taking you out i mean this is my first time but i think we're gonna be okay i'm just kidding i've been doing this for about three and a half years now and look as we're going down these rapids we're probably only gonna lose one or two of you i'm just kidding we're all gonna be fine and have a good time you know it's that i'm just kidding and, and overemphasizing the danger and so forth. Before they go out, Charlie Day's character gets a call and it's from his fiance and she has broken up with him and he is emotionally devastated and they all head off down the river. And instead of going down the gentle rapids, since Charlie Day is now in a state of suicidal depression, he sends them down the dangerous path of rapids, escalating with the family getting bounced around and thrown all over the place. In this scene, I don't have a note as to what song is playing, but it's like, you know, all by myself or only the lonely or some shit like that. And the look on Charlie Day's face is of just sheer, like, what is it? It's just serenity. <laughs> yes. That he knows this is the moment of his death and it is by his own doing. He looks so happy. It made me just appreciate how funny Charlie Day is in everything. Long story short, the whole family gets bounced out. He stays in the boat and goes over a waterfall where he ping pongs down, presumably to his death, but but not really the end credits say he, he survived possibly it later finds a bear uh, in a sequel to the movie the edge oh that would be oh good. i know charlie dave v bear in the in the wilderness now you're talking <laughs> he should have been in cocaine bear now that i think about it the one thing i will say for cocaine bear as a film is the bear in that movie loves cocaine well it's cocaine bo I know, but the movie does not shy away from the fact that this bear loves cocaine. It's quite funny. So we cut back to the family. They're in the car and Kevin says, hey, can we just go home? James says, I don't even care about Wally World. Debbie screams out, we almost died. And then Seal's Kiss from a Rose comes on the radio and Rusty tries to get everybody to sing along again, which what makes you think that's going to happen? And then the car runs out of gas in the desert. Russ, in a state of desperation, starts tapping buttons and he hits the top hat button and all the windows explode. <laughs> yeah. Then he finally, he hits the muffin button and the car starts up again, but then it drives away and he hits the muffin button again and the car explodes, leaving our family in the desert to die. Right. And this is where we get the, in quotes, National Lampoon's vacation rant. But it sucks. Like Clark Griswold lost his shit shit when everything fell apart and that's one thing i will give credit to chevy chase for doing he was good at having freak out moments he's no gene wilder when it comes to freaking out because nobody freaks out better than gene wilder here ed helm's performance is so tamped down and also it's mean-spirited he starts calling out his family for being a bunch of assholes and at the end he essentially is like fuck all of you i'm leaving it's all about how they're disappointed in him and the one thing he says that i think could have been in the core of a good moment is him saying, you know, I've gotten jobs from all kinds of international carriers as a pilot, but I turned them all down because I wanted to be at home more with you and the kids. But that is kind of buried under like, oh, he said the F word for the first time in this movie or whatever. Yeah. But when he starts to storm off, then we see coming down the road, the 18 wheeler with the teddy bear latched to the front of it. This 18 wheeler is chasing Rusty and he finally stops and then so does the 18 wheeler. And mm -hmm. then out comes Daryl from The Walking Dead. Yep. And he says, your wife left this back in the truck stop in Missouri. I thought you might want it back. And he, he hands her, her her wedding ring. That's what he's been trying to do this whole time. Yeah. He says, well, it looks like y'all stuck out here. Rusty says, yeah, uh, I guess we are. You think you could give us a ride? And he says, well, where are you headed? And they say, San Francisco. And he's like, yep, hop on in. 
a stripped down version of Holiday Road plays and they arrive at a bed and breakfast run by Chevy Chase and Beverly D'Angelo. But as they're getting out of the truck, one of them asks, so what is the teddy bear on the front of your truck all about? And he says, oh, it just puts the kids at ease. And they say, oh, you have children? And he says, no. It's left at that. The implication, of course, being that he is luring and stealing children for his own nefarious purposes. There's more pedophilia in this movie than Sleepers, Natural Born Killers, The Woodsman, Mystic River, and that remake of Nightmare on Elm Street combined. It's shocking. And I don't know why the makers of this movie think pedophilia is funny it's not i mean clearly yeah i guess you know here's what it is it's not that pedophilia is funny this is playing in the sandbox of shock humor right 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 that it's trying to do things that are just so what that as we've talked about on this podcast so much of humor comes from surprise and shock is a form of surprise but in this case it's like like just stop it right again it's that seventh grader thing of sitting in the back of the class and hurling out pedophilia jokes because yeah. that is the replacement for actual humor is to to shock someone maybe it was because the mpaa board made them cut out all the incest jokes like they really packed it with those knowing that they'd have to pare it down They're like damn we got to keep all the pedophile stuff huh. right all yeah right. it's the like horror movies used to do that where you have a couple of gags so extreme that you know the mpaa is going to ask you to cut them that way you can leave in all yeah. the other stuff all right so at this bed and breakfast Jesus immediately Christ. somebody is coming out saying don't stay here the people who own this place are crazy they go inside with chevy chase and beverly d'angelo it's pretty much immediately a dinner scene yeah because i don't think chevy chase in his contract was required to stand up for very long he looks like he just woke up from a nap in this movie and he acts like he's still taking one in this movie he's also not aged well no i mean i get that we all get older and we all age he looks crazy in the eyes not to compare an older person to a younger person if you look at him during his peak and i can't believe i'm going to say this like during like memoirs of an invisible man fletch you know that era he looked like a matinee idol yes in this he's got one eye that's pointing a different Different direction and he looks like he's reading off cue cards he's phoning this shit in he just his shirt is untucked and unpressed his hair isn't combed and i don't think any of this is by design <laughs> right this is just how he showed up on set right he was just like i'll do my own wardrobe my makeup and hair when they tried to you comb know. his hair he's like, get the fuck off me yes so they have this dinner scene and james talks about how his guitar got stolen and there's a very sad bit this is in the realm of watching harrison ford run chevy chase says oh i've got a guitar you can have and does this physical comedy shtick that he's sort of known for where he fumbles this guitar out and ends up like behind the cabinet that he pulls it out of and everything and gives it to james and there's some wordplay where it's like oh this is from bob dylan but not that bob dylan spelled d-i-l-l-o-n but he got it from Jimi hendrix and james says oh the Jimi hendrix and he says no and that's kind of it Uh, Mm -hmm. And that's really the whole scene. They also ask how Audrey's doing. And then they say, well, you know, their marriage is a sham. They sleep around on each other. I wish they had a more solid marriage like you and Rusty. First off, of course they're having sex with other people, or at least Stone is. You don't have a dick the size of a baby's <laughs> leg and keep that at home. You farm that out. That was understood when they got married. But also, why on earth would your parents know that? I mean, because they're proud of it. Because Audrey and Stone record this and put it on the internet. You know, me and Stone are swingers, as in to swing. Yes, we have sex with other people. Yeah. I don't know if Baby Cooper's even mine. We don't care. I just wanted to have a baby. It just seems weird they know that. We feed cows to cows. So anyway, (laughs) upstairs, Rusty discovers that Debbie has been reading not The Help, which is what the dust jacket is, but called... Gray Sports Almanac. (laughs) Right. A book called (laughs) Is Our Marriage Dying? And Debbie shows up behind him and sees that he's got this book. And Rusty says, you know, is that what you think, Debbie? Is our marriage really dying? And she says... Yes. Yes, it is. 
this is where the movie tries to have that emotional beat and it's totally unearned where she says you know Rusty you never stopped trying with us and I think I kind of did it's her fault that's what the movie is kind of saying <laughs> and then she says you sacrificed so much for us by not taking those other jobs and he says I didn't sacrifice anything Debbie I have everything I ever wanted and then she tosses the book in the trash and he puts the wedding ring back on her finger and then they fuck mm -hmm. presumably we have now healed the wound of this marriage rusty goes to see his dad clark who's cleaning one of the bedrooms in this bed and breakfast with attempts at humor rusty says hey dad will you take us to the airport we're not gonna go to wally world you know what they say it's not the destination it's the journey but the journey stuck and then clark griswold says yeah the journey sucks but that's what makes the destination all the better when you get there you gotta take your family to wally world never let that go i didn't and then Clark opens up the door to the adjacent bathroom where there's a guy in there taking a shit that's staying at their B&B. &B, and Clark just sprays this guy for a good 15 seconds with Lysol disinfectant. That's right. Rusty says, we don't have a way to get to Wally World. We don't even have a car. Right. And that's where Clark says, well, I, I got something for you. And so he takes him outside and he hits a remote to open up a garage, which reveals this little Nissan sedan. And mm -hmm. he says, oh, no, not that one. And then he he hits another remote and that opens up the door to reveal the family truckster from the original movie is the reason that we see the nissan sedan first because filmmakers assume that everyone in the theater knew that he was going to have the family truckster there for him is that a head fake because if you weren't aware of what the family truckster is this lime green and brown wood paneled station wagon that's iconic from the vacation films that's not really a very funny joke I mean, I don't disagree with you, yeah. I'm expecting something. Surprise, you give me something different. To me, this would have made more sense if he was like, hey, I've got something I want to give to you. And he was like, I think this might get you where you want to go. And you kind of have this, not hallelujah moment, but this moment of like, oh yeah, we're tying the original to this one and blah, 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 blah. And let it be a nice moment. It just, it feels like an unnecessary joke that isn't funny. Yeah, exactly. And also the joke is Rusty saying, well, can't we just take the Nissan instead? And Clark saying, no. Anyway, so they get on the road. Holiday Road plays yet again because we paid for the song. We're going to use the fucking song. I love Holiday Road. I think it's a catchy song. Yeah, but this is like the fifth time and the third version. That's okay. Come on. As they drive, James says, hey, wait, I thought we were going to the airport and we were going home. And Rusty says, kids, when your dad makes a promise, he keeps it. And Kevin says, this sucks. And everybody in the car looks miserable and their faces are just saying, we just want to go home. Just like the faces of the people in the audience watching this film. No one wants to go to Wally World. Right. That's not what happened in the original film. Everyone by this point of the movie where you were at the point of exhaustion, it was like, you know what? We've come this far. We've got to get to our final destination and when they get there it's this triumphant albeit catastrophic finale although that movie ends on a positive note this movie ends with a kick in the dick and a smack on the head <laughs> yeah yeah and there needed to be more buy-in from the other characters to show that they'd grown like debbie needs to be supporting rusty the right. kids need to be you know finding yes. some peace with each other and being like you know what you're right dad we despite all the shit we've been through we're gonna make this happen you know yes just something Yes. And instead, you have to wait till we get to Wally World. Not just get to Wally World, get inside. And then somebody, I think it's Kevin, says, oh, this is dope as fuck. And it's like, ah, uh, okay. I guess that's the point where we make this emotional term that nobody really cares about. And then the gag is, hey, we're going to go to the Velociraptor. And they play the Chariots of Fire theme music, which is from the original yes. when they were running to the park. But here, instead of rushing to the park, they get in line for the ride and there's a four hour wait. Right. And then you just see this kind of parade of dissolves as it goes from four hours to three hours, then two hours, then one hour, and then that changes back to two hours again. And finally, they get to the head of the line. They're about to get on the, the roller coaster. Mm -hmm. And then from nowhere, Ron Livingston shows back up in this movie with some sort of platinum pass bullshit. Yeah, the asshole pilot from the beginning of the movie that no one remembers. He's there with his family and he's like, sorry, we paid for this fourth time riding it. And and then the worker tells the Griswold family, uh, sorry, folks, this is the last ride of the night. The park's closing, which that's not how this shit works at all in theme parks. Right. But for movie purposes, they they all have right. waited in line all this time just to have Ron Livingston and his family. It's like, take 
their seat. And Ron Livingston recognizes Rusty. He's like, hey, Econo Air, how about you and your family go fuck yourselves? And then Bo, for no reason at all, the Griswold family and this other family that they've never met before have this bare knuckle Donnybrook fight. Yeah. And beat the shit out of these people. This is some real world star hip hop action. It's in slow motion. At one point, Kevin, who clearly just carries a plastic bag in his pocket at all times, wraps this thing around the head of the asshole dad pilot in an effort to kill him. Yeah. He's got to get his murder list out at least once a day, Bo, or else he starts hurting himself. I like the fact that there is that callback. That, like, this is just the dirty fighting that he does as a rule. They finally kick the shit out of this family who submit, you know, like, you win, you win. And then yeah. off they scurry. And nobody gets arrested, Bo, because it's a couple of white families. Not only does no one get arrested, they don't run the ride until the fight is settled. Sure. And so the Griswolds, they climb onto the roller coaster at the very front and as it mm-hmm. climbs up the track like that first hill that like chunka 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 they start singing kiss from a rose james kicks it off doing an acapella version and everybody joins in yes it's really goofy and forced but you know what it's a moment it's like oh okay i kind of see what you're doing movie but because this movie can't let anybody ever have fun Ever, once the roller coaster starts going, it immediately comes to a grinding halt upside down on one of the loops. Which, Bo, this is not how roller coasters work. <laughs> right. There is such a thing as inertia and centrifugal force. Unless it's magic or voodoo or the earth stops spinning or some shit, it breaks the realm of reality. Like, what are you? It's just so fucking dumb. It's terrible. <sighs> then finally, the I mean, this is kind of the end of the movie is night falls. They are finally pulled off this thing which we don't see it just sort of happens where they're taken off the ride where people are being led away with blankets over their shoulders and there are emts there then they go to the airport this is where rusty is just like hey you shitty kids you're gonna go stay with the petersons remember them from the beginning of the movie the what yeah the, who? <laughs> the, the petersons you know then rusty says he's gonna take debbie to paris and we cut like it's such a, an abrupt thing of where in the airport he's telling the kids that they can fuck off and then they're on a plane in jump seats next to the bathrooms where rusty has pulled some strings so that they can take this flight to paris they're in these jump seats or something that every time somebody opens up the toilet door it bangs against their legs yeah. again they can't win for losing right and then the movie ends with debbie saying so how long is this flight and rusty says oh about 12 hours honey and she says yeah oh, perfect And then that's it. You hear like a toilet flush. Edith, Archie. Right, and that's it. And then, you know, there's credits roll and we see pictures of our characters from throughout the film showing a little bit of follow-up, but nothing. I I mean, there was nothing in that that stuck out as far as like, oh, this totally resolves this character or anything. It's just... it's In fact, it reminds you of things that they mentioned earlier that don't matter. Like there's a shot of Rusty and James racing a go-kart against the Petersons and theirs is falling apart. And other, like we mentioned the thing where James and the girl from the Jeep are kissing and the dad's there. The only one that's worth mentioning is the very last one where you see half a picture of Stone and Aubrey and the camera pans down. You see that he's wearing shorts and like the top third of his cock is sticking out from under his shorts. Yeah, that's pretty good. It's it's up there with Saddam Hussein waggling his dick in the South Park. Yeah. I mean, just a surprise cock at any (laughs) time. Sure. Whether it's this or any movie with Kevin Bacon in it. This is a much better surprise cock than Chevy Chase showing up in your movie. (laughs) Absolutely. But that's it. Well, what do we have coming up for episode two of this road trip extravaganza? Chad, we are really raising the stakes. Uh, Let's hear it. Not only is it a road trip featuring one of our favorites, Nicolas Cage. Wild at heart? No, not that one. The much worse road trip movie starring Nicolas Cage. A movie called Drive Angry, which involves Nicolas Cage escaping from hell to save his granddaughter while being pursued by Hell's accountant, as played by Billy Fix himself, William Fichtner. Never heard of this movie, never seen this movie. I'm uh, assuming that it is of the highest quality? No, Chad. It is a middling action film at best, but it stars two (laughs) actors who are absolutely chewing the scenery at every step of the way, and I think we're going to have a lot of fun with it. All right, I will look forward to it. So come back and see us in two weeks' time. Like, rate, review. You can email us at picksixmovies at gmail.com. Bo, any final thoughts that you have on Vacation 6, the vacation 
functioning. I'm just trying to decide if I need to call DCS on this movie for all the pedophilia talk. Don't make weird shit. We'll see you in two weeks time, everybody.